circumstances. May the conference we organize today benefit to our life, broaden our knowledge, sign our ideas, and lead us to be successful, productive person, which in turn will boost the dignity for our nation. Jesus, guide and bless our heart and our mind with the light of your guidance, impart your supreme wisdom upon our activities. Help us to speak our minds clearly. Help us to listen to each other, respect each other, love each other, so that we are included to the blessed person. Protect us from untethered temptation. Show us the right path and give us knowledge and strength to perform good things. Equally show us and make it, it clear the bad things and give us knowledge to strength to avoid them. You are the one who can fulfill our prayer. Amen. Okay. And now uh, for this public lectures, we also have 178 participants that already registered. They are from UNCRIP, Atmajaya University, Muhammadiyah University, SKIPM, Palangkaraya University, Indonesian Polytechnic Business, BPPP Banyuwangi, Banjarmasin, DKP Central Kalimantan Province, and also students from Panama, students from Philippines, students from Malang, and many others participants that can be said one by one. Thank you so much for joining today. And let's begin this evening with the opening speech from Mr. Dr. Agustin Terasnarang SH. Time is yours, sir. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Dear Council of the Palankaraya Christian University and staff, dear speakers and lecturers in International Public Lectures, dear Dean of the Faculty of Fisheries, Palankaraya Christian University, Mrs. and Mr. Lecturer of Parangkaraya Christian University, for all students of the Faculty of Fisheries Parangkaraya Christian University, ladies and gentlemen, whom I respect. To begin, allow me to express my gratitude to the Dean of the Faculty of Fisheries and at Parangkaraya Christian University, for inviting me to speak at this morning international public lecture this morning international public lecture is extremely beneficial for students faculty members at palangkara christian university the province of uh, central kalimantan and the republic of indonesia as an archipelagic and maritime country uh, as is well, as is well uh, known, the Republic of uh, Indonesia Sea Area accounts for approximately two thirds of the country's total land area. Indonesia has an approximate land area of uh, one million nine hundred nineteen thousand four hundred. 40 square kilometers and an approximate ocean area of 3 million 273,810 square kilometers. Meanwhile, Central Kalimantan covers an area of 153,564 square kilometers as one of uh, Indonesia's 34 provinces. Additionally, Central Kalimantan province is home to 11 major rivers and 33 small rivers that flow into the Jaffa Sea. Or Central Kalimantan province 
has uh, swamps and lakes that uh, are almost evenly distributed throughout the district and city boundaries. Thus, I believe that advancements in the field of research and fishery businesses are very possible, whether in the sea, rivers, lakes, or swamps area. However, in addition to the potential that I mentioned, there are several issues that uh, require extensive uh, research, specifically the threat of damage to aquatic resources as a result of uh, various activities, both uh, at sea and uh, on land that flow into the sea and rivers. Additionally, a good solution needs to be found for uh, uh, sorry, it's okay. Funding for uh, fishing activities that uh, are not uh, environmentally friendly, resulting in pollution or of sea and river water. Thereby, I hope that uh, Central Kalimantan's fisheries development can become one of the best in Indonesia. And uh, furthermore, it is hoped that uh, today's international public lecture with uh, contribution from international speakers and lecturers will uh, contribute to a positive and useful understanding of uh, fisheries. Ladies and gentlemen, as well as uh, lecturers who I respect. Mr. Joko Widodo, as the President of the Republic of Indonesia, has already appointed two regencies in Central Kalimantan to become the food estate region some time ago. Apart from agriculture, plantation, and animal husbandry, the primary commodity is uh, fisheries. Thus, the current international public lecture is extremely timely. As a result, I hope that the outcomes of the international public lecture will contribute significantly to the development of the fishery sector. I wish the dean, lecturers, and all students at Palankara Christian University Faculty of fisheries the best of luck in making the most of this international public lecture opportunity. Enhance learning and teaching abilities at Palankaraya Christian University's faculty of fisheries with the goal of creating a glorious and bright Palankaraya Christian University. I express my appreciation and gratitude as a senator, regional representative council of the Republic of Indonesia from Central Kalimantan province, to the speakers, lecturers of international public lecturers who took the time to deliver their lectures this morning. I wish you all the best of health and may God bless you all. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sarah. And then we have, yeah. yes, hi, Jonathan. Jonathan. Hi. It's okay. You can continue it. Uh. Yes. Okay. So next we go to the speech, the opening speech from the Dean of Fisheries Faculty of Palankaraya Christian University. Please, Mrs. Dr. Impa Mingawati, SPI, MSI. The time is yours. Good morning from Indonesia for all participants, especially for the Honorable Mr. Dr. Agustin Teraslarang, a senator, member of the regional. Is Council of 
Republic of Indonesia. Mr. Salsam Ravindranath, Marine Biologist and National Geographic Educator from Madrid, who will give lecture one about aquatic resource management. Next speaker, Mr. Brian Asesia, a teacher of Laguna State Polytechnic University, Los Banos, Philippines. Ms. Juliana Fastway, an EAL teacher of University of the Panama Pagina Official. Mrs. Uripa, an educator from uh, Jakarta. Mrs. Asi Pedriana, Cecilia, SPI, MSI. A lecture of Aquaculture Study Program of Fishery Faculty of Palangkaraya Christian University. We will give lecture two about alternative fishery innovation ways to play. Face and gadget we should give to the face of the Enemy of God because of his guardian and grace that we can form or corner of the world at this happy moment and to be born of international public letter. The great great topic of aquatic resource management and alternative history innovation. The purpose of this event is to create an understanding, especially for students to build a new paradigm related to aquatic resource management and alternative fishery innovation, in addition to build and expand cooperation networks. The Faculty of Fishery at Christian University of Palangkaraya with the Aquaculture Study Program cannot be separated from the part that must be taken to pay attention to the presentation and sustainability of aquatic resource. Because if the resource are sustainable, automatically fishery activities, including aquaculture, we are so sustainable. The idea in this international public letter activity refers to the many performance indicators of universities that this type of activity outside the corridor one key standard research. One of these indicators of joint letter involving university entry of student and letter. We thank you to parties for the support in organizing this event. While we also apologize if there are shortcomings and awkwardness in this event. Dear God and good heart for all of us, God, wife, God, youth, and thank you. Thank you, Inpa. And then, now, it's time for us to get a lecture from our special speaker. The first lecture will be led by Mr. Salpam Rabindrana, his experience and expertise on this field will help us in getting more knowledge today. Mr. Safam, please, time is yours. Thank you, uh, teacher Hola. So I'll share my screen now.
hope the screen is visible for all of you and my voice is clear yes yeah well uh once again thanks uh for the invitation and i'm glad uh to have an interaction with the students as well as the remnant teachers here for uh the fishery resource management and a related topic and well uh as far as i know about indonesia is one of the country which a very wide uh variety of uh, inland as well as the aquatic resources and uh, resource management is a very uh, wide area where we start discussion then it goes on for a long time so i'll just uh, brief the basics uh, of the uh, resource manage aquatic resource management uh in generally we use the fisheries resource management both the inland as well as the uh, marine ecosystem we are using so <clears throat> fishery or fisheries when we uh use the word uh, it impact for the all the fishes or the fish in sense not only the normal fish or what all are the aquatic resources reared for the commercial purpose or uh, even uh, the ground or the area from where the fishes are caught and even now the present day the commercial as well as the industrial uh, level of fishery operation has been uh, very widely uh, using all over the world so the occupation or the industry for catching and uh, rearing the fish are also comes under the terminology we use when uh, the fishery or the fisheries so it's a wide area again uh, fisheries uh, in all over the world is categorized into subsistence artisanal commercial industrial as well as the recreational fishery is also now uh, it's an emerging area with a very wide based upon the tourism especially uh, and mostly for the uh, coastal nations and the island nations like maldives recreational fishery is also one among the highest uh, uh, economical uh, profitable uh, fishery we are following uh, subsistence obviously most of the coastal areas for their daily uh, use purposes the fishers used to fish as well as to feed a little bit of their uh, close friends and relatives and artisanal fishery uh, in two different ways i have seen in the world Mo normally artisanal fishery for a small uh, level of community to feed upon and as well as in some of the african countries when i was working at that time i have seen the they are uh, using the artisanal fishery uh, to the nation as well because of the uh, less infrastructure development happens to there uh, then commercial and industrial nowadays expanding into most of the coastal uh, nations and uh, industrial fishery is uh, actually uh, having a very big uh, turnover uh, for the country economy uh, most of the coastal nations and the island nations like maldives then when we uh, look into the resources so resources fishery resource that is the all aquatic resources which are the value uh, to the fisheries that means it gives the value to the economy uh, that all comes under the fishery resources not only the fish apart from that all other uh, material or other material what we are obtaining from the sea as well as in the uh, riverine ecosystem those all things comes under the natural aquatic resources uh, such as the different kinds of species different strains of uh, fishes and other other uh, aquatic resources then different populations of species then stocks then assemblage uh, legally caught by the fishing operation all these things comes under the uh, category uh, the terminology we call the fishery resources so when we look into the management aspect of the fishery or the aquatic resource in general when we say we have to look into all these resources but not only the fish what we consume then again fisheries uh, we have categorized it to capture and culture fishery capture fisheries uh, just gathering and removing the fish from the place in which it has been gone that is uh, mainly from the natural environment we do uh, with the process called harvesting that is gathering and removing of the fish from the place where it is grown so normally fishes will be growing in the natural ecosystem and the fishers will be doing the fishing operation either of the type of the fishery will be doing the fishing operation to remove uh, the fishes uh, for the purpose of utility and culture fishery uh, again uh, we have categories to do in aquaculture and lately we are uh, saying it's a marine culture because when we started doing what you are seeing on the right hand side the pens uh, the cages 
uh, marine environment directly we started cultivating in most of the uh, part of the world we are highly established with the agriculture operation apart from the uh, different uh, types of or methods of the aquaculture too so here what we do is actually we select some of the species which is having a high economic value and high demand based on that we will be selecting uh, the cultivable species and that we will be cultivating in a confined environment with ultimate care uh, to produce the maximum yield uh, for the requirement or the demand to the community or even to the different part of the nation. So aquaculture actually we started doing with, uh, with the aim of a part of the management purpose because rather than giving the fishing pressure to the natural environment, uh, confined area we bring and uh, rear it and uh, take it out from that and utilize it for the as per the demand is coming. So we will be giving a, a part of less uh, fishing pressure to the natural environment. And apart from that, nowadays we are using some of the areas in the aquaculture even after rearing. Uh, we are releasing into the natural stock to so replenish the stock in the natural ecosystem too. So here when we look into aquaculture or mariculture, what we are involving is the growing rearing and then capturing the fish from the tanks or the ponds or the cages or whatever way we do the culture practices. So uh, that is the way how do we do it. So now uh, aquaculture is also a part of uh, the management purpose for the stock replenishment also some of the areas we are doing this one especially for the government and some of the non-governmental agencies. Then when the resources are there then definitely we have to have certain management uh, protocols. So here also the aquatic resources or the fisheries resources, irrespective whether it comes from the inland uh, aquatic resources or whether it is from the marine resources, the management uh, process is required uh, to uh, make a sustainable utilization of the resources what we are getting from the aquatic area. So normally uh, we enforces, create and enforces the rule uh, to prevent the overfishing as well as uh, to help the overfished stock to rebound. That's what I earlier said. Nowadays, we are using even uh, cultural practice to release the cultivable species back into the natural ecosystem to uh, recoup the natural resources. So here, management will be mainly concentrating to prevent the overfishing as well as uh, to uh, rebound the overfished stock in the natural yeah. ecosystem too. And uh, apart from that major aim uh, to achieve uh, uh, none of the, uh, optimal and sustainable utilization of the fishery resources, that is also required because generation after generation we are consuming fishes and uh, definitely our future generations also need uh, the fishery resources or aquatic resources uh, for their uh, pur purpose of, of uh, this uh, kind of uh, food as well as the livelihood uh, income, for us, especially for the coastline nations. And that way, uh, which brings the benefit to the humankind while safeguarding the ecosystem too. So here it is a, when we talk about the management, it is a multifaceted plane where we have to look into. So general concept is that that aquatic resource management or the fisheries management aim or target only to uh, do the manage uh, the fishery resources which is available in the water. No, it was the earlier concept, but now uh, thing has been changed. And nowadays we are seeing into all the uh, phases or all the dimensions of the uh, thing, including the ecosystem uh, level of approach, which should not tamper the ecosystem because the uh, feeding habits or the food chain or the, of the, or the ecosystem should not get tampered based upon the fishery of a particular species or a few uh, uh, important species or economically important species are taken out from the ecosystem. So that is why now mostly we are doing uh, the management through the ecosystem approach. We will come into that in later slides. Then obviously, uh, MSY, the maximum sustainable yield for almost all uh, species have been declared and assessed and kept. And uh, the major target for uh, the management uh, is to maintain the stock size within the MSY limits or through allocating the total allowable catch to the fishers or the number of boats in the fishery. And there are uh, so many factors. Some of the factors will be coming into the, uh, the forthcoming slides. So likewise, we actually, what the management, fishery managers we are doing is to maintain the 
MSY uh, within the limit so that it will not, the particular species will not go uh, to an overfishing scenario. So for that, we have taken a lot of uh, measures uh, to maintain the fish stock within the MSY limit so that uh, it will be controlling uh, the stock directly as well as indirectly and uh, also reducing the fishing mortality, uh, especially in terms of bycatches. And that is the way how the management nowadays proceeding to uh, control uh, the fishery aspects in the ecosystem. So uh, in general, when we look into uh, commercial cash data collection, the biological data and the information uh, from the particular ecosystem and the recreational catch estimate. As I said, recreational fisheries are somewhat uh, emerging nowadays in most of the nations. So now we are including the recreational catch uh, estimates also for the stock assessment as a whole. Then based on that, we uh, declare the management action uh, to safeguard the species or the resources uh, within the MSY limit. So as I said, nowadays, uh, the management mostly move into the ecosystem approach of the fisheries. That is one of the evolved and emerging field in the management sector of fisheries or aquatic resources. That is the interaction takes place between the fisheries and the ecosystem. So earlier concept was there only to manage that particular uh, economical value species was only concentrating. But again, we started observing uh, the diminishing of the stock in one or other way. So once we realize the ecosystem uh, involvement into the balancing of the nature, so we uh, started the EAF uh, processes and uh, different uh, planes and different levels of ecosystem approach of fisheries we are uh, doing for the management purpose. The fish in the sea and the people in the boat is one of the major consideration. How much fish is in the sea? How many people are in the boat to catch that fish? That has, has to have a ratio so as to retain uh, the stock for the future purpose, as well as to get a uh, reproduce and uh, next, uh, let them produce into the next generation and uh, so on. Uh, the fishers also will be flourishing in the nature. So uh, the common consideration when we look into only commercially important species, we are given much targets into uh, the management practices, even though some of the uh, non-commercial uh, species as well as non-commercial resources are also having directly or indirectly in, uh, related to this particular species. So the management effort has been uh, established beyond the level to look into as a whole ecosystem consideration rather than going for a single particular species. So there comes the inclusion in the management paradigm based on the fish and the fishes. So the, and as well as the other elements, both the abiotic and the biotic factors in the ecosystem also, and as well as the human system, that's what I really said, the people in the boat. So all these things club together in an inclusive paradigm we have made, and that is what we call as the ecosystem approach to the fisheries. And that way we emerge the management policies and regulations and also the conservation practice also incorporated into the management as well as the one of the major conservation practice in the MPA, wherever we can fit into the management area, there we are fitting the MPA uh, to for the controlling the fishing operation. And that is the way we regulate the uh, fishery operation in a particular ecosystem. So in 1995, uh, FAO has put forward the code and conduct for the responsible fisheries. So there onwards, it has been uh, changed the responsibility to uh, the human to the nature, the fisher to the nature, in a little more precise, the fisher to the nature. As we said that they have, it is the livelihood for the fishers, as well as the food for many in a community too, as well as the generation after generation, uh, we should get uh, the resources from the aquatic area too. So responsibility has been shared to all, not only for the fishery managers. So earlier fishery managers and the fishery uh, department people uh, were the more uh, <clears throat> responsible for keeping uh, track on the fish stock or the aquatic resources in common. But now, it has been later found out that every human being has uh, got their own responsibility to the aquatic resources. And uh, that is the way the inclusive system of ecosystem consideration has been evolved. 
So every human being has been uh, have uh, the specific uh, role and responsibility to the ecosystem, which will be uh, replenish all these uh, stocks and maintain uh, the stock into the level for the usage after generation after generation. So that is the way how the EAF has been emerged. And uh, that has given uh, for over a periodicity of time, we are noticing that it has given a, a really uh, good uh, support to the management of the aquatic resources too. So some of the management uh, tactics, what we are following, very few I have just listed out. That is a uh, major thing is the catch per limit or the total allowable catch TAC for a fisher uh, when they go for a fishing operation. So what is the allowable catch for them to do one, part, one particular fishing time, whether uh, fishing days we can say. And the fishing effort limits the number of uh, limitation for the usage of boats as well as the gear and as well as the uh, number of days or number of fishing trips to be limited so that uh, the stock will get the time to replenish back even after the catch. Then restrictions on the size group. Size groups only uh, normally uh, as per the management, we say that fishers will be allowable to grow uh, to a level of maturity. And the normal size group for the catch is uh, measured for all the species, just at least one reproductive cycle is over for that particular species. So that even if we are taking, why we are uh, we have taken that way, one reproductive cycle, one reproductive cycle over, then one fish produce uh, several thousands of eggs. And out of that, uh, a lot, at least of the survival rate of hundreds of fishes will be there. So one fish we remove, we are replacing 100 for one. That is the uh, logical concept behind that one. So uh, that is the way the restriction on size, uh, which will be caught and retained has been uh, evolved. Then gear restrictions. Type of gears used in different areas will be restricted uh, based upon the type of the species and type of the uh, ecosystem where we are using uh, the fishery operation. Then access control by the way of uh, giving license to uh, do exploitation or doing the fishery operation in specific areas in the uh, aquatic environment. The allocation of share is yet another way how the territorial uh, right to use for the fishers. Uh, so mostly we know that the your right to use the uh, space or right to use the area, especially for the coastline community, will be the having the total right to use that particular coastline water. And even if any other uh, fisher which is coming into that uh, territory, then they have to obtain a special uh, license from the authorities, then only it will be allowed. But in general, normally for to uh, encourage the subsistence and artisanal fisheries, mostly the coastline nations will be uh, keeping that uh, particular coastline area, people will be uh, permitted to do the fishery operation into their coastline boundary. That is the territorial use right for the fishers. And uh, very severely, we are following that one uh, systematically so as the responsibility for the fishers will be high to utilize the resources. The time, area, gear type closures. So this is also at another uh, way we are managing based upon the time of uh, the reproduction as well as the migratory time. We will be avoiding the fishing in that particular area. And as well as the gear type, as we said that the specific gear types will be using uh, to get only the uh, desirable size of the catch and leaving all other uh, uh, type the uh, fishes back into the nature to replenish into the ecosystem. So here, uh, one of the way uh, the integrated coastal zone management system nowadays we are using uh, in terms of MPAs, uh, we are uh, using this time area gear type closure as well as the closed area and closed the Seasons also we are following now for the fisheries management to replenish the stock in the nature. So when we look into the management, it is a, as I said that now it is a responsible uh, fisheries management. So uh, earlier only the management, fisheries managers as well as the fishers uh, with the partial with the government uh, only will be involving, but now uh, it has been a shared responsibility has come in terms of fishers, government, fishery stakeholders, then coastal stakeholders, 
as well as the external agents like the NGOs and the academics as well as the scientific field of people. We all are responsible uh, to maintain the resources uh, for the sustainable utilization for the generation after generation. So now a combined effort of all these uh, parties together will take over to the fisheries management aspects so as each parties will be uh, beneficial based upon their aim or goal in terms of the resources which is available in nature. For example, when you look into the costly stakeholders for the tourism uh, and the scuba diving, one of the major thing nowadays emerging all over the world. So tourists are coming to the costly nations to see uh, the fishes as well as to enjoy the taste of the fishes too. And scuba diving, without fish, there is no scuba diving will exist. So they have to take care, those people who is doing these operations have to take care of their own responsibility to maintain the stock in the particular as well as not to uh, make damage to the ecosystem. So that is one of the simple example I'm telling because nowadays these two things are uh, emerging all over the world. So now it is a shared responsibility between all these five parties will be taken care for the fisheries management. So that is the way again, share responsibility to the ecosystem approach will give a much mileage for the fisheries management in future. So now the question will come how the MPAs will be uh, managing uh, the fisheries. But uh, it is true that MPA uh, up to certain level, we can do the fisheries management and the conservation practice too. And MPA we are using as a, one of the major tool for the management and conservation by the way of uh, protect the specific life history stage within the area and control the fishing mortality. Only the allowable area will be there for the fishing and some of the places it will be totally closed for the fishing. So fishing mortality will be comparatively less. Then uh, spillover effect is a common thing in the uh, marine uh, protected areas when we look because fishes will be migrating. So how much buffer zones and how much buffering we are keeping into the uh, uh, MPAs based on that, we can bring down the spill over effects and the boundaries can hold uh, the fishes within uh, the safeguarding uh, level. Then, apart from that, uh, you'll be serving the source or sink of the fish egg and larvae because it is an ideal ecosystem, not much tampered or not much uh, having hindrance with the human in, uh, involvement. So, uh, that will be improving the recruitment into that area. So that will be replenishing the stock in the future state. Then by the way of protecting the habitat and food web, as well as the integrity and biodiversity of that particular area will be uh, flourished. And uh, reducing the bycatch, that is one of the major thing uh, which we can attain from the MPA and discarding and other negative impact of harvested species. Then protecting the endangered species and the spe other species which the society want to protect. These all things can be bring down under the MPA. And uh, to reduce the competition between the user group and the opportunities of certain other groups which will be utilizing the uh, resources for their uh, economical benefit. Then potential hedge against the uncertainty that also can be bring down with the MPA. So MPA we are using as uh, one of the tool for the management and conservation, but it doesn't mean that MPA is totally giving the whole uh, fisheries management goals or aims to be uh, maintained. But still, uh, it has got its own level of uh, protection to the environment as well as protection to the biodiversity into the defined uh, protected area in the <clears throat> sea. So based on that, the sustainable resource management, because resources from the water or aquatic resources we are using for uh, different purposes and people are using for different levels, uh, uh, the aquatic resources. So all should get the resources for generation after generation. So based on that, the sustainable resource management practice we started. And within that here, I'll be just concentrating on mostly on SSF, that is the small scale uh, fisheries operation because uh, that is mainly considered for the coastline fishery uh, fishers or the fishery units, as well as for the inland fishery units too. So human well-being and ecosystem health is the primary thing we look into. Human well-being, obviously the livelihood of the coastline fishers should be maintained so that they will be having their own livelihoods uh, to gain their uh, daily bread. 
and the ecosystem also should be uh, made healthy as that is the way of ecosystem approach that is a holistic approach we can say with an interaction between the society economy culture as well as the environment society of the uh, con uh, concerned area <coughs> sorry the concerned areas fishes and the economical uh, level of the fishes to be maintained and the cultural practice every cultural uh, practice will be having a part of conservation too and that will be directly and indirectly giving a, a good health environment around the society so that is what comes with the uh, eaf with the human well-being and ecosystem health so uh, here it's a flow chart uh, you can see uh, the framework will be mainly based upon the open or the closed level when open level when we uh, look into when an immediate action is taking place uh, required to take place then we go for the open framework with the public hearing then the action and the rule making so but that will be giving some of the immediate emergency uh, level of operation and in the normal level we go with the uh, traditional methods that is the fishery management plan and environmental assessment and environmental impact statement and based on that the scopes and the options will be looking into then we hear for the public both the cosplay as well as the users then based on that the final action and the rule making will be taken so this is the uh, common way practice and uh, by seeing it uh, it seems to be very simple but it is a uh, big uh, responsibility is there wasting because we have to satisfy all the uh, stakeholders which is uh, involved into the aquatic uh, resource utilization. So the consideration what we have to give into uh, this is the biological, ecological and environmental, the technological, socio-cultural aspects, the economic considerations and the consideration imports by the other parties. Uh, who is getting beneficial uh, from the resources directly as well as indirect uh, levels too. So these all are the major concerns or considerations we have to give when we make a fisheries management plan in terms of rules and policies uh, to uh, execute it in the field. So all these aspects uh, should be taken very keen observation then only the uh, success of the management practice will uh, take place in a particular area. So uh, planning uh, obviously will be coming based upon the objectives, then based on the objectives, we'll be gathering the information, then analyze and forecasting the information, then consultation with the interested parties, who all interested parties here is comes with the direct as well as indirect utilization people for the uh, aquatic resources. Then based on that, the decision making and formulation of the rule. So up to that is a, a common level stage. We can go through with the flow, but every time what we have observed is the implementation and enforcement area. So they are actually uh, every, we, have, we feel, uh, we face a lot of hindrance uh, during the implementation as well as the enforcement time. But even then uh, with the many frictions and other things, we all over the world we could able to manage up to certain levels uh, for the uh, management of the aquatic resources and once the enforcement is taking place obviously we will be getting the feedback and again we will be re going from the cyclic operation again from the planning and objective based upon the amendments required uh, while when we see the uh, demerits or uh, some of the gaps which we found during the implementation and enforcement stage so from the ASS of the small scale fishery, one of the major thing nowadays part uh, we are doing mostly to the cosplay nature is the participatory uh, management practice. That is what is called as the co-management. Co-management incorporating or involving the public, common public in the cosplay area as well as the fishers who are uh, in the cosplay area involved into the management policy decision making because they know the place better than uh, the fishery managers who visit the place and collecting the data and finding. So now, uh, in especially for the small scale uh, fishery area, the co-management practice or the participatory management practice is uh, taking a, a high uh, chances of management success. So here the government uh, and uh, the communities combine together 
So the knowledge of the scientific knowledge gathered by the government, also the TEK, the traditional ecological knowledge uh, shared by the community from that particular cost lane will be mingling together to make the decisions. Uh, even uh, certain areas of my uh, work time also we have seen with the scientific knowledge when we go, uh, in especially my African uh, tenure time, we ha I have seen much of the TEK involvement in that because uh, the fishers uh, have the cultural level. They have a lot of ecological knowledge incorporated in their cultural practices. And that has given very good uh, light or very good path for the scientific method what we are bringing there to establish. So traditional ecological knowledge is also one among the uh, emerging field into the fisheries management area, especially the conservation when we say in general. So this is what the way how the co-management or the participatory management will work. And uh, of course, that has given a positive change into the resource management aspects too. Then uh, sustainable uh, fishing practice, the least harm to the environment and the fish. So here we give much important to the less harm to the environment priority. When the environment is healthy, then obviously the fishes will grow. That is the concept. So uh, much importance to the ecology ecosystem approach will give to the environment primary importance uh, over the fish or uh, the fish species and also preventing the illegal and destructive fishing and overfishing then MCS system monitoring control and surveillance will be given. And this one, as a co-management, we are giving community stewardship program and we are assigning uh, the MCS to the community uh, volunteers. We will be giving training to them and they will be looking after more into the surveillance and control uh, area. And they will be associating with the NGOs as well as the uh, municipal governments. And based on that, the system will work very uh, closely. Then food loss and waste is one of the thing we have seen FLW during the harvesting time. So management measures have been taking a uh, very high uh, privilege to look into this matter, FLW, uh, to encourage the discarding of fish at a sea because it will be replenishing the nutrients levels in the sea and uh, selective fishing gear. Uh, will be uh, retaining uh, the fishes, which is not undersized, uh, so that they will get the time to maturity and reproduce. And uh, abundant, lost, and discarded fishing gears, that is the ghost gear in general, we say, or ghost fishing. So that also uh, we are taking into consideration because it's uh, unintentional mortality is causing to the fishes because of the uh, ghost gears, which is present. So uh, several organizations are taking care of to removing these kind of aspects from the sea, especially in the coastline areas and delay in removing the fish from the fishing gear leading to quality deterioration to catch. So the spoilage and physical damage can be uh, uh, hype up prominence uh, is coming, so that also to be considered. Then consumption and damage of fish by the predator prior holly. So that is also to be taken into consideration. So here actually, uh, it's, it's uh, FLW is a part of uh, ecosystem approach too. How do we uh, concentrate much into the ecosystem or environment well-being will give a more protection or more uh, level of management to the aquatic resources in the uh, nature. So that is the way how do we uh, practice nowadays the ecosystem approach. And uh, here, uh, once again, based upon the goals, the operational objectives will be defined and operational objectives will be based upon the management strategy and the reference points will be taken into consideration. And the performance indicator will be analyzing and management measures will be implementing. And based on that, the uh, <clears throat> resource management for the time to time being will be are uh, taking place. So uh, that is all a brief about the fishery uh, management area from my side. As I said that it is a very, very wide area. So I have just touched uh, for the ecosystem based approach a little bit. And uh, once again, uh, to keep into mind that ecosystem uh, is a primary important. So how, how much care we are taking uh, to the ecosystem, which will be giving or which will be replenishing the resources into a healthy level, which we can utilize for a generation after generation. That is what our ancestors were doing to us 
in terms of uh, culture and practices. That is what I mentioned. Nowadays, we call it as the traditional ecological knowledge. And in between, we made a gap and now we started uh, recouping the gap and we are uh, started rolling back into the conservation practice and hope in the forthcoming decades, the things will get normalized and we will be uh, able to feed our uh, future generation the same way as uh, what we enjoyed uh, the aquatic resources. So thank you all for listening. Uh, that's all from my side. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, give the presentation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Selfang. And this, this is a very wonderful presentation I think, for us here. And now uh, I just want to tell for all participants here that we also like now from YouTube. So for you who cannot join this meeting, you can also see directly from SKIPM Palangkaraya YouTube. Now it's time for the second keynote speakers. Mrs. Asi Pebrina Cecilia, SPI, MSI. Place and time are yours. Thank you, Ms. Hola. Hello, everyone. Good morning and good evening, Ms. Juliana. Thank you for your coming to this presentation. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Asi Pebriana Cicilia, and you can call me Cici. I am from Palangkaraya Christian University. We can skip my curriculum vitae. You can see it later. Today, I would like to presentation about the alternative pit fish innovation, ways to blaze. I apologize. If my English pronunciation is not good because my English is passive. I hope you enjoy. I hope you listen and enjoy my presentation. What is this? This is the organic waste. Organic waste is the residual material resulting for activity that are divorced of a result of the production process both in industry and household. Something that is product for animal, plant, and even human that is not used have the potential to become waste material. Everything that is not longer has to use or full force and need to be divorced of, right? In this picture, you can see organic matter is very high composition on 63%. And then the character of organic waste are describable, high water content sort of disease has the nutrient, release the smell and a mirror of society. So how to solve organic waste? It could be by composting a coenzyme biopori and bioconversion. And in this type, I offer you the conversion to solve organic waste. Why bioconversion? There are several reasons success. One, world population growth because of the exponent number of population we so need put, especially content of a lot of protein. Crisis of fish and livestock feed, it haven't 
because of the high price of fish meal and the main component for making pellet. Decreasing the quality of agricultural land due to chemical fertilizer. And there is new paradigm in organic waste management that is because of nutrient in organic waste, actually the organic waste still contain a lot of nutrient, so we could do nutrient cycle with called bioconversion. So what is bioconversion? Bioconversion is a process for degrading, extracting, and converting the nutrient, such as protein and lipid, locked inside organic waste by using larva hermetia illusion. Bioconversion for fighting biomass of larva, like high protein contents with high quality aquapid that we will estimate and bio fertilizer for valorizing of agro-industry by product. What is maggot BSF? Maggot BSF is organism come from black soda play as that can be used as an official for supplying the fish or livestock of feed. Type of larva is from larva play that is black and look like a waste. The first of cycle the, the first of cycle BS at larva come from the other flies with do the metamorphose. Is this one of the innovative strategies and has great potential as a method of sustainable organic waste management. Hermetia illusion, known as the black sword play, is a insect belonging to the Ordo of Diptera family of Stratinomidae and subfamily of Hermetinae, native of tropical, subtropical, and temperate region of the American continent and has been found in many countries across Europe, Africa, and Oceania. And this insect Consider as not pest, doesn't a dozen affair in the list of dissing creating organism or factor for pathogen. The difference between maggot BSF and ordinary maggot. The body of BSF maggot is downy hard and has curly visible segment. While the other maggot doesn't have this characteristic. The, 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 head, the head of BSF maggot is red, but the other maggot is a black. The movement of BSF maggot is very slower than other maggot. BSF maggot cannot jump while other maggot can do that. The BSF maggot, the baby BSF maggot color is milky white or tan to light brown. It different with their feet, while the other maggot is always clear white. 
the body shape of the BSF maggot is short and round, while the other maggot is pointed and elongated. And then, with the BSF in pre pupa phase, the color will be dark brown. Then, in pupa phase, it's it become black and the body shape doesn't change. Finally, the pupa state, the tile is little bit bent inward. In other hand, another maggot, when the pupa is like this brown and the shape like a capsule. This is a BSF like cycle. BSFX about three days become and then BSF larva about 60 days and then prepupa about seven days. After that, pupa about seven days and the metamorphosis of BSF adults about nine days. The advantages of maggot BSF. One, BSF insect larva with high protein content. It is more over than 40%. Two, the principle of BSF cultivation that doesn't produce waste or zero waste. The protein contents of BSF larva exerts the growth of fish, livestock, and enhances the immune system. Four, maggot BSF was the composer. Five, maggot BSF has, has high economy value. Six, six Cultivation maggot BSF doesn't require and high cost. And seven, maggot BSF is able to reduce the export of fish meal as a component of making fish and animal feed. This is uh, some resources on the use of BSF maggot for fish and livestock. Utilization of BSF maggot for fish and livestock of it. In the feature, you can see the conversion of Balarak stock fish that is fed by maggot and pellet. Balarak stock fish more bigger and grow faster if they are fed by maggot and by pellet. This is another example for ornamental ornamental fish. The fish, the first fish is a pig by maggot. The second fish is a pig by blood, blood worm. And the third fish is a fish by Pellet. And this is the baby maggot. This other example of BSF meal for poultry. BSF maggot products that are still in the research and development state. Look at the feature in front of you. Here the example. This is one. This is a dry maggot for ornamental fish. Two, meal maggot for soap, animal and fish feed. Three, oil maggot for cosmetic product. And four, cascot or maggot pieces, biofertilizer, agriculture and organic 
pesticide. This is future product of Maggot BSA from Bioma and PT Maggot Indonesia Lestari. I have become a partner of Bioma and PT Maggot Indonesia Lestari as a community to do some resources and development for the innovation of BSF maggot product. I think that is all my presentation today. Let's we now reduce, refuse, recycle waste and serve our art. Take action, miracle happen. If not us, who else? Thank you so much for your attention. Always to bless. For further question, you can contact me in this email address. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Asi Febrina Cecilia. It's very wonderful presentations about how uh, we make the alternative face fit innovations. So uh, now it is time for the guest teachers to share their experience and opinions maybe taught or their uh, knowledge about marine aquaculture and also about the fisheries. But before they start, I give the opportunity for all participants. If you have questions for the speakers, please type your questions in the chat box and with the form name, country and institution and the questions proposed to who speakers. We let the participants to ask for whom that already typed the questions in the chat box, okay? Because that's the rule here. Now, let's start to hear the teacher's thought related with topic given. Please, Mr. Brian Atencia, time is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Teacher Hola. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, uh, dear teachers, especially to the uh, two speakers who gave a very insightful uh, discussion. The lecture was really great, most especially when it comes to the field of uh, fisheries. Uh, here in our university, the Laguna State Polytechnic University, we're one of the universities here in the Philippines who caters uh, fishery as what we call aqua fisheries. And uh, from grades 11, we are already providing it up until to the college level. So I'm very lucky that one of our uh, great professors when it comes to fisheries, uh, Sir Charlie Sharrett is here so that he can give his actual uh, experience, okay? And his expertise, a very short uh, info about what our school, LSP Los Banos can offer. And then one of my students, okay, uh, Francine will be sharing her, you know, story. Why did she chose to be in this strand of aqua fisheries, and why did she choose LSP? So it will be uh, Sir Charlie who will give a brief uh, info, and then after Sir Charlie, Francine will share her story. Why did she choose aqua fishery? Uh, Sir Charlie, please. Hi, sir. Hello, I am Audible. Yes, sir, you are. Yes. yes. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm, by the way, I am Charlie. I am an instructor of the LSPU, Laguna State Polytechnic University here in the Philippines. And basically, I am a graduate of uh, fisheries, Bachelor of Science in Fisheries. And I took my, <laughs> actually, I, I've been graduate uh, last August for my master's degrees in aquaculture. And I am a licensed fishery technologist. And I'm also handling subjects here in our campus, more on aquaculture, uh, introduction to other fisheries, and uh, as well as uh, aquatic ecology, uh, and more, more on aquaculture. So here in uh, like Laguna State in the Philippines, 
students were be able to pursue their fishery degree uh, when when this when they're still young when when they are in uh, high school uh, level but uh, the more complex and the more sophisticated part is when they uh, pursue their college degree so uh, LSPU is more on uh, more on the, the trust of the campus is the fisheries in Los Banos and uh, students are, are able to pursue to conduct and learn uh, more on sophisticated uh, experiments on fisheries or cultural experiments and as well as we have the OGDs on the different uh, fa fa facilities in the, in the fishery sector in the Philippines. So uh, I think uh, one of the, the, the most uh, important part be a, uh, a food, food provider, not only in, in our country, but uh, Philippines is uh, known as the good export uh, export of food, not, not only aquaculture, but more on marine, like seaweeds. But uh, I, I could say that uh, this uh, forum could give, uh, webinar could give us uh, enlightenment, uh, could give us practical approach, like what the first lecturer uh, said uh, earlier, that we, the, the human, must not jeopardize the future generation in terms of food production. So I think that's all. And if you have some questions, clarifications, or uh, suggestions in terms of fisheries management, you can have my email. So I think uh, Sir Brian had my email and I could, uh, I could uh, send it to you. So I think that's all. And thank you again for this uh, great and wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sir Charlie. And uh, Francine? Uh, could you also tell to our, you know, to all the participants, why did you choose uh, aqua fisheries and why in LSPU, Francine? I chose aqua because I'm interested yeah. in the uh, state for technical university schools, but provide those course on fisheries. I want to learn more on aquaculture and would help me choose my preferred career choice. Thank you. Thank you, Francine. Uh, you are mute, Teacher Brian. Yes. Thank you again, uh, Teacher Hola. We are really, uh, you know, we're really honored right now because our grade 11 students, okay, and then the higher years were able to attend this very insightful. Actually, even if I'm not, uh, I'm not in the field of fisheries, but I learned something and uh, I got interested with our second speaker because they, uh, she mentioned that they are using, you know, the, the insects or as what mm -hmm. they call maggots in feeding the fish. So I'm a bit uh, interested to know more because here in our country, okay, most of the time the pellets are being used, but then there are some, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, fisheries who are using maggots as well. So this is really interesting and this would help us, not just our, you know, our school, but all the participants here. So thank you, Teacher Hola. Thank you very yes. much. Yes. Okay. You're welcome, Teacher Brian. So because this is uh, the best fit innovations from our faculties of fisheries Palangkaraya. So uh, now <laughs> we have the next guest teachers. Teacher Yuliana Pasquez. Okay. Okay. It's a very wonderful uh, time for you to share your experience here. Please, welcome. I think you are mute, Teacher Yuliana. Hmm. Oh, yes. I was mute. I don't know what happened <laughs> with mix today. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you first. Thank you, Hola, for the opportunity. And um, this is another way. To, to learn about other uh, fields, other areas. And actually, uh, even though I'm not in the fishing field like uh, teacher Bryant, I have family members who are involved on that area. So that, that's why I brought today a mini, a mini presentation because I know I have uh, some time to talk about it. So I'm going to share the, the information that I, I bring to you. 
uh, right, related to uh, the aquatics resource management and alternative feed, feed, uh, feed fish innovation, but in Panama, in this side of, of the world. All right. So here I can I can uh, tell you that we have uh, three main authorities here in Panama in charge of uh, developing this wonderful field, which is the Aquatic Resources Authority, best known as ARAP. The Panamanian Aquaculture Association, which is the ASPAC, and the National Aquaculture Directorate, the, the DNAC of the Ministry of Agricultural Development, MIRA. So the first one, which is the ARAP, works by hand with the Ministry of Agricultural Development, MIDA. A, and uh, I, I can I can let you know that uh, the Aquatic Resources Authority in Panama refers to the status of the Republic of Panama in the main obligations of which a periodic report must be submitted in the way of a com compliance with the conservation of management measures, which includes among others, um, all right, uh, which includes, among others, uh, a regional register of vessels. This is the information I brought to you. The cash report, the activities such as the port state landing and the transshipment, the monitoring system, the control and uh, surveillance cash vessels on fishing support, as well as the market regulations and financial commitments for the good performance of the organization. Therefore, the Panamanian state must try to comply with all these measures before these organizations. And um, the aquaculture in Panama is promoted in two directions, right? The commercial aquaculture carried out by the private sector and whose main production line consists of reading of a penate shrimp and the subsistence of semi-commercial aquaculture where the project of fish farming with its eminently social connotation and it is aimed primarily at populations with limited resources. Um, the government through the National Aquaculture Directorate of Ministry of Agricultural Development support both approaches on the hand operating the infrastructures to support and implement the fish farming program in continental waters and on the other managing other experimental and advisory stations for trout. So the peanut shrimp and the palemonid, palemonid farming in order to consolidate these aquaculture industries, which the goal is to obtain the foreign exchange for the country via the export of the products. And this last one I'm going to mention is um, the massification program in the rural aquaculture. So this is a program that the government uh, started to implement in the rural areas. So they first focus on the germ membrane tops, right? This material used to cover the, the, the different, um, um, uh, let's say the, the, the places where the fish or the shrimps are going to be rice the cultivation of artisanal oysters, the promotion of the entrepreneurial women of Boca del Toro, which is a province here in Panama. And I can also say that this is not only the cultivations of artisanal oysters, if not about the Malaysian, Malaysian sweetwater big crab, the tilapia nilorica, and the red tilapia, and the colosoma. Which, which are um, some, some fish for, for food. Here, there also the diatomea the algae, which, which is one of the sources in the feeding part to feed the, the, the fish and trims. Also the phytoplankton and the zooplankton with uh, the, the rising of also polyketo uh, worms um, the, to stimulate the reproductive shrimps and the recycling and use of weights of animal and fishing origin for the preparation of the thillage diet of organism, the cycle in confinement or for the Pacific snapper fish like the one you see here, consumption a campaign that we have here, similar to the colosoma, which is a very, very big fish and um, with a lot of meat. 
And the government considerations that this part is to support and implement the fish farming program in continental waters to manage other experimental and advisory stations for trout, the pH rim and the palimonid farming. And the goal at the end is to obtain the foreign exchange for the country via the export of this product. So this is what I brought about Panama. And I, I think that it's very, very close related to both uh, speakers, main speakers today. And um, and I see that we are going almost for the uh, um, same path, right? So we uh, get some ideas from other countries and other countries get ideas from us. So we work together. Thank you. Thank you so much, teacher Juliana. And now we go to the next teacher guest. Uh, we have teacher Uripa from Malang East Java. Please, teacher Uri. Thank you so much, teacher Hola. I will share my presentation. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Urifa from Malang, Indonesia. And uh, first of all, I would like to say happy National Feast Day in advance. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we celebrate that yeah, in and in this year, 2021, the theme of National Feast Day is increased immunity against COVID and stunting. Uh, a National Feast Day is celebrated every November 21st. It was established by former President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono on January 24, 2014, through the Presidential Decree of Republic Indonesia Number no. 3 of 2040 concerning National Feast Day. Uh, but why the Indonesian government need to do this movement? Yeah. Uh, even though Indonesia is a maritime country where marine product will never be lacking to support Indonesian people, however, fish resources has not been utilized optimally. In this fish day, uh, may increase the awareness of Indonesian people about the importance of fish as food ingredient that contain high quality protein. In addition, the stipulation of National Fisheries Day is also carried out as a reminder that Indonesia has fishery potential that needs to be utilized optimally, but still has the principle of nature conservation. Uh, the implementation of National Fish Day and the movement like to eat fish or in Indonesia, Kemar ikan, right? It's like a movement that uh, we must like to eat fish. So this is my uh, city major. They promote how to cook fish. And uh, International Movement Day or Kemar ikan like to eat fish encourages government to conduct training activities yeah. for the many for manufacturing of processed fish product with the aim of providing knowledge and skill to society. Each province coordinated with the village head to send the delegation to join training program. The participant will get training modules in the form of receipt for making process fields. Implementing training in the form of groups by direct practice with mentoring structures of the team. So I had an opportunity to join this training. And this is the fish product. So it's the shredded fish, or we call it apon in Indonesia, and also fish nugget, and also fish cracker. And this is the very popular cuisine, which is called xiaomai. It's like Chinese. Uh, name, yeah, maybe uh, we adopt from the Chinese feed. And, and all of them are favorable cuisine in Indonesia and they become an alternative way in consuming fish. Now we need to introduce uh, fresh water fish farming or fresh water fish culture and its product. Uh, fresh, water, fresh water culture system or cultivable organism are cultured in different types of culture system. 
Many culture systems are based on traditional ideas that have been used for years. This is the example of fish culture or farming, the, or fish farming in open, uh, open fish culture. The owner uh, made an innovation once he cultivated the fish, he opened the restaurant. So the waste of the food will be fed to the fish. So um, the owner invited the, custom, the customers to come enjoy and learn fresh water fish culture in very fun way. While waiting for the meal ready, they can feed the fish the restaurant. And the restaurant also serves seafood menu. So it's uh, no waste here then because uh, once they not they left over food will be fed to the fish. And nearby this restaurant, there is a fisheries department office. So if the visitors want to get more information about fresh water culture, they may come to the office and get more information and more knowledge. Now let's see the festival. We call it Pelarungan. It's uh, actually Alms Earth and Sea Festival. I think it's on, I don't know in Palangkaraya, but it's happened in Java. Yeah. Pelarungan, the purpose, uh, the purpose of Pelarungan ceremony is an expression of gratitude to God who bestows sustenance and safety on fishing community for years and hope for God's blessing and guidance for the future. In the tradition of the Larungan Festival also contain educational values, divinity values, friendship and kinship values, mutual cooperation values, and maintaining balance with nature values. Through this tradition, the community can preserve the culture of their own area so that it will not go extinct. And another important part of this festival is uh, stocking marine, marine seeds such as crab, shrimp, milk, milk, milk fish, and other seeds. So uh, she was the previous marine and fisheries minister, uh, one of my idol. And then we must introduce marine life to our uh next generation so let's educate ourselves about marine life and then it is our responsibility to introduce marine life to our community and young generations since marine is important uh since marine is as important as land and fresh water the earlier young generation know and understand about marine life the better they will be uh, since actually we do not inherit this nature from our ancestor, but we borrow it from <clears throat> our next generations. So let's make sure that uh, our next generation can enjoy the nature, marine, uh, as beautiful as the way we enjoy uh, the nature. So in 1994, I and my biology friends were uh, having study tour in this area and in 2018 i brought my my students to this area to uh, introduce them to the marine life so sorry i could not take underwater picture because my camera was not adequate for it and also um, they must uh, taste how is the taste of the sea so they know uh, know well that salt come from the sea and how they survive on the sea. So it's so much fun if a young generation know and feel uh, their self, uh, the beauty, and also the adventure, adventuring uh, process uh, in marine. So this is a wonderful, it is my experience. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Teacher Uri. I want to dare to, you know, <laughs> swimming in the sea. Wow, that's very Me wonderful. too. Yeah.
Yes, you too. We can do it together. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. It was, uh... yeah, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so now, uh, oh, I see here is teacher Nadia from Russia. Hi, oh, teacher yeah. Nadia. I have a teacher Olga from Mexicati. Hello, teacher Olga. Oh, yes, and teacher Olga too. Hi. Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. Yes, my name is Olga. I am an English teacher, and I am so excited to be in this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We are very happy to have you here. Mm -hmm. And then, and now we go to the discussion time. So, uh, here I see uh, some questions in the chat box. Okay, uh, operator, please uh, help me to share the questions in the share screen. Okay, for participants that already sent your questions here, I will ask your name. I will, okay, I will call your name. The first question is from Benny Postria. Benny Prosia from Unclip Indonesia. Uh, he wants to give questions for Miss Asi Pebrina. Okay, Benny. Benny, are you here? Hello, Miss Asi Pebrina. Mm. My question is, my God is actually given a lot for fish feet. Can my God also be used for animal feet, so cows, pigs, and cow? Thank you. Okay, so uh, you can answer it. Uh, Miss Asi, or I have to go to the next questions. Uh, okay, Miss Hola. Okay, I will try to answer your question for Benny. Uh, if for pig and cow cannot be in fresh maggot, but as a mixture of animal feed. Thank you. Okay, so uh. Do you want to share about videos or something yes. okay. for the more explanations? Okay, so operator, you can stop to share the screen for a while. Thank you, Miss Hola. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Miss Asi. Okay, so now, uh, please, operator, share the questions again. Okay, now we have the second questions. Oh, from UNCRIP. Oh, students from UNCRIP are very excited for these public lectures, I think. And then, Chandra. Chandra? Uh, hello? My Hi. name is Chandra. Hello, Mr. Stelfam. Yes, hello, Chandra. Yeah, my name is Chandra. I'm from Ungrip, Indonesia. So my question is, fishermen like to catch fish using illegal fishing gear for profit. This is prohibited by the government. What are the solutions given to fishermen <coughs> so that the fishermen's economy still increase? Oh, thank well, you. Well, it's a good question, Chandra. Uh, because uh, this is one of the major issues we are facing in the fisheries management sector. Uh, because as we said, uh, we are uh, <clears throat> good in uh, regulating all other levels with the closed seasons type of gears, etc. Thing, but illegal fishing is a big threat for the fisheries management people too. Uh, <laughs> why I said that means. Uh, one of my assignments with the coastal resource management and uh, disaster restoration program. So in that, uh, I have to face a lot much with this uh, illegal fishing uh, issues. Uh, illegal fishing is actually of because of two reasons it happens. 
And that's my personal observation. One, of course, uh, profit-oriented, as you have mentioned. It is a profit-oriented thing with uh, less effort and more fish and giving to the market and get more profit out of it. Because effort is less than what all things they are getting is a profit. That is one way. And uh, yet another thing also I have noticed uh, that when uh, the fishers are lacking uh, the equipment to do the fishing or they were unable to uh, hold the... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, what the different types of gears and crafts for their daily usage. Some of the fishermen will be just borrowing it for the daily wages and that may not be yielding the fish's uh, value, what they are getting per day. So also they are uh, turning towards the illegal fishing uh, operation. Uh, to be uh, very uh, uh, openly say that government is having a lot of measures to control this uh, illegal fishery. And a lot of measures and a lot of uh, level of penalty uh, also imposing over the illegal fishers if they are uh, found red-handed. Red and nowadays, but even then, system, uh, it takes time to implement the things. But uh, nowadays, in many of the places, even uh, my assignment areas also, what we have done is we just equip the, uh, that's what I said, the responsible fisheries management. So what we have done is we uh, train the community uh, for the MCS program and uh, we will be uh, making the marine stewardships or community stewardship program with the stipend for the people who are volunteering for the training and they will be given by uh, the government or the municipal government area a stipend monthly so that will be given them so they will be monitoring any kind of illegal activities in the fishing operation is taking place in within their coastline areas. So that is one of the way uh, we can prevent it. Because when community deal with the community, who is doing the illegal fishery will be more ease than when the government or other organization uh, involved in to prevent those things. So that is one point uh, we have uh, noticed as a good way of uh, thing. Then another thing is that in majority, even in my uh, assignment time also, we have introduced the alternative livelihood programs for the uh, fishers. Because those who all are unable to uh, move, uh, as I said, that they were not having much amount of uh, money to hold uh, the fishing gears and traps. So for them, alternative livelihood methods with the certain subsidies with the, the agriculture bank and the municipal uh, level and different organizations uh, were supporting them to do uh, artificial, uh, the uh, alternative livelihood program, either through the fishing operation or uh, like the crab fattening, fish fattening techniques, those kind of things also we have introduced. Uh, to cope up so that they will not go for the uh, uh, illegal uh, level of fishing. So these are the two ways uh, we have, uh, we can uh, re regulate it, even though the hard pass rules or the legal measures are there against the illegal fishery as per the government policies and regulations. So, but these other two things are practically feasible, what uh, even I can say, because we have seen the positive impact with this, uh, this level of uh, stewardship programs, as well as the uh, alternate livelihood program has given some impact to uh, reduce the illegal fisheries. Then yet another thing, the organizations, the government and non-governmental organizations were uh, in, informing to the public also because when this kind of fishers comes into the market not to buy, that give discredit because when the illegal fishing things, especially the blast fishing and other things come, we can very easily identify the fish with the blast and uh, death and which is many. So uh, that is one of the way, uh, since long time, government and other organizations are advising the community, but community also need food for their uh, like, regular uh, consumption. So uh, that is a very less percentage only effective. But the other two factors are giving some positive impacts in many of the case areas. And even I have seen in one of the place, even some of the illegal fishers have been turned into the marriage towards later stage. I hope uh, that will be clear for your uh, question. I think that is good. Is it clear, Chandra? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Salvam, for the answer. It's a really good. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Salvam. And oh, I see in the chat box, teacher Nadia said that illegal fishing is also a problem in Russia. Oh, also teacher Juliana said too, the same in Panama. Wow, yeah. illegal fishing is a very big problem now, I think. Yeah. So illegal. here's... Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is one of the major issue all over the world, this illegal fishery. Uh, that's what I said. The major thing happening is in between the poverty line and the uh, need of uh, income for their livelihood things. They are generate this illegal fishing. 
Yes, yeah. I think it will be related with the questions from Angela Marucci from yeah. Unclip. Uh, she okay. asked something about sharks. Yeah. Okay, uh, Angela. Hello, Mr. Salva. Hello, Angela. I'm Angela Marucci from Fisheries Faculty of Palangkaraya Siam University. Nice to meet you. Uh, my question is how to protect the shark to find our FN taken. Thank you. Yeah. It's again a good question, Angela. This is also one of the biggest uh, management issue we are facing all over the world, I can say, this uh, shark finning. Because uh, as, as far as now, as on 2021, around the 37% age of uh, shark species have been categorized under the sharks and rays. Uh, fishers have been uh, categorized under the Protected Species Act. And uh, some of the shark species have been put under the Endangered uh, Species List by the IUCN and CITES too. And uh, shark fishery regulation exists all around the world in all the nations and all the coastline areas we are following. And by 2011, again, we have amended the Act and uh, got implemented the Shark Conservation Act. And uh, many of the uh, governmental as well as the non-governmental organizations are working uh, to protect the sharks too. So uh, as we said that uh, policies and regulations are there, but uh, illegal activities will take place too. But we can't, we can't, but comparatively, nowadays it is getting uh, reduced. Uh, we, I can say that one. Uh, because uh, finning is one of the major thing we observed in the shark. Uh, so normally what the fishers do is when they go for fishing, uh, not all the fishers, very few, uh, when they go for fishing, when they get the shark herds as a whole, then they just catch them and uh, cut the fin, take it and leave the shark back into the water. The dead shark will be back into the water. And several areas in the survey we have observed also sharks were uh, dumped without a fin. Once fin is lost, the shark is dead. So that way also we have observed and uh, several places we have taken the measures also for that one. Uh, because fin only bringing hiding in the boat is very easy, but some of the times they get caught also. When they get caught, then severe punishment and penalty is there. So, Shark Conservation Act by 2011, uh, it starts implementing all over the world. And uh, year by year, the amendments are coming because uh, when the new uh, way of uh, shark finning is happening. So, uh, that way we are protected species. Now, also the shark is. Uh, but uh, percentage of uh, illegal uh, way of utilization is comparatively less nowadays when compared to the previous year, we can say. And also, people are giving much awareness about the shark because earlier uh, there was a threat about the shark as the shark is uh, apex predator, obviously. So they eat every uh, fish in the ocean. Recently, in one of the places, it was uh, one of the issue raised. The shark is eating all the fishes since it is an apex predator. So the fisherman is not getting the fish. But it was a uh, false information given to the local public as well as the normal fishermen to confuse them so that the shark finning can take place very quickly. But that also has been uh, blocked. And uh, <clears throat> shark, obviously, being an apex predator, shark is required to sustain the equilibrium in the ecosystem. That is a fact. That is the science, uh, scientific fact too, which is to be accepted. And uh, another one threat against the shark, the shark attacks the people, et cetera, et cetera, thing is also a false information. And uh, as far as shark is concerned, shark will never ever come into directly come and attack a person who is in the water or who is in swimming, snorkeling or diving. Even if the shark comes and attack like what we are seeing in the movie, definitely I will not sit in front of you and talk like this because I have uh, worked with the shark population studies in Eritrean Red Sea and I have uh, been with the shark several times underwater too. So shark incidents, we say, uh, actually not attack uh, in officially, we say that shark incidents by chance, uh, usually they give for the defense, they attack the people. So these are some of the myths against the shark, a few myths against the shark, which also will be uh, giving more uh, room for the people illegally to do the shark training. So Shark uh, Protection and Conservation Act is very severely taking place nowadays in most of the countries, mostly the coastline countries, and uh, surveillance is very high, and uh, imposing uh, much punishment over that is also following nowadays.
So hope uh, that is clear. Okay, how is it? Uh, Angela, is it clear? Hey, yeah, Angela, you're on mute. Are you <laughs> yes, Angela is mute. You can okay. unmute. Okay, okay. Um, thank you for the answer, Mr. Yeah. Okay, and I see Welcome. here is in the chat box. Mr. Charlie Sierra says that illegal fishing declined in the Philippines since President Duterte assumed office. This shows the great factor to have a right leader not scared on threats in terms of catching illegal businesses. Oh, that's uh, based on the insights of Ms., uh, Mr. Charlie Sierra. And here's I see two from Olga in Mexico. People kill sharks just because they are dangerous. Oh, really? My God. Uh, yes. Hola. Yes. It's a really a bad practice because so many young people uh, practice surfing. You know what surfing is. And so the sharks are attracted uh, by the movement of the, of the surfers. So what is the, um, the reaction of a shark? Uh, destroyed the 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 table or I don't know what is it is called where this where the surfer it's uh, put the feet and try to swim and to play with the waves so the sharks are uh, impressive by this movement and the people around the coast uh, kill them just because of that okay yeah. Uh, shall I add upon to that, Ms. Olga? Sorry? Uh, shall I add upon to your answer uh, for the this one? Actually, yes. uh, the surfboard when the surfers, this is one of the things uh, mostly we have seen in uh, USA and other places too, shark attacks or shark incidents, we say. As I said that it is not the shark is coming by seeing the person actually because when the shark looks from the down, uh, the, uh, the surfer put the leg and the hands out of the surfboard and they will be swimming. And for them, that is a practice for them to get into the uh, wave. But from the shark look, shark will not be knowing that it is a human or a surfboard because they don't have uh, that capacity to analyze. They think that it is a prey for them. So they just come and attack. And obviously when the attack comes, uh, majority time in the surfboard also shark bite have been noticed by sure. And uh, when the soft body part easily get uh, caught by the shark too. And the feeding frenzy is one of the major issue for the shark when the blood stains comes. So then it will be more aggressive. Then all the sharks will be gathering too. So this is actually happening in reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you, Mr. Salkam. Yeah. So, now, please. Uh, hello. Yes, Can yes. I get a one minute to, uh, uh, I forgot the name, uh, uh, um, so Charlie? To oh, Mr. Charlie, yes. Charlie, are you there? Charlie, Mr. Charlie. Okay. Yes. Ah, sure. Charlie, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a uh, wonderful thing what you have said about the Philippines, and uh, because uh, I am also one of the person who work for the CRM program in the Philippines, and which I was explaining for the livelihood program introduction and the. Uh, marine stewardship program that also we have imparted in the Philippines only. So in Philippines, I have seen a majority of people have been, especially the illegal fishers have been turned back into uh, the marine stewardship program as well as the alternative livelihood program they are uh, receiving with both hand. So that's what my experience with the Philippines when I was working there too. So obviously, uh, we had to salute uh, President Stings too, his uh, law and order that even I appreciate, which I have uh, personally experienced there. So thank you, Charlie, to bring out that point. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salpam, and also Mr. Charlie. And please, operator, search the screen again for the questions. Okay, because I think we have uh, limited time. So I will just uh, ask one student to ask the questions. Oh, I see here. I will skip the questions from me because I prefer the questions for teacher Chitty actually, but I will skip it. I can ask her later. So now it's time for Nadia, I think. Nadia is from Atmajaya University. Okay, Nadia, you can ask your questions. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And hello to Mr. Salfan. 
My name is Nadia Dalantara. I am from Faculty of Law in Atmaja University in Jakarta. My question is, is there any regulation for illegal fishing from government, especially in your country? And what kind of sanction given to the perpetrator? And in your opinion, how to stop this action? Can you please give us this solution? Can be provided? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Nadia, for the good question. Mm -hmm. Illegal fishing, uh, as I mentioned earlier also, that is one of the very big uh, threat for the management practice too, all over the world, not only in India or Maldives or uh, any other country as we have seen in the Philippines also. So uh, here, the thing, oh, sorry, I got uh, lost the question uh, paper. Okay, anyway. Uh, so every government is having uh, the uh, rules and regulations to prevent the illegal uh, fishery operation by sure. But again, uh, the issue is that uh, illegal fishers, by the name, uh, literally mean that they do it illegally, which will not be much important. Then they know how to manage uh, the things. So that is also, I don't want to say more about that one, but even then, you know better. So, but all the governments are imposing the rules and we, and we find out, the government find out, the government and other organizations also, uh, then they are severely punished. But even then, uh, things will happen in the remote areas because the coastline is a wide, very wide area. One place uh, where it's clearly vicinity, they will, may not operate. Sometimes they may go uh, to the offshore area and they do the practice and come back also. So that is uh, it's a, a kind of uh, imbalance level of both the things. Rules and regulations is one side and uh, still the practice is going on the other side. So uh, some of the places, as uh, I have said, uh, alternative provided they are willing to come into that because if the person is going for their livelihood for the participating in the illegal activity illegal fishing then they are ready to come back when we give the alternative livelihood programs and they are uh, doing also majority we have seen also but some uh, they go for shortcut methods so without a note within no time they get the maximum profit that way profit or end only seeing is we can't uh, change them it will be quite difficult and uh, I think the third part of the question, could you please show me that question once again? Ola, could you share that question? Okay, could you share the questions again, operator? Please. So that is what generally we do for the illegal fishing activity. So the <clears throat> sanctions given to the things, uh, we try uh, to give them, the, generally the government and the municipal uh, area people and other non-governmental organizations also trying to give them certain funds to improve their livelihood programs with the, either through the fish or any other kind of alternate level. One of the things what we have practiced in the Philippines is that the crab fattening, a group for fattening, those things. So we, they need only less expense, which will be uh, subsidy level will be provided by the organizations, government and non-governmental organization. And uh, they are doing it in the natural environment itself as a community and the community will be sharing the profit out of it. So that was uh, seen as a positive change there, we can say. And likewise, other uh, level land-based things also, uh, we can because we can't ask the fisher to come and do some some other work it will be very difficult because they are skilled uh, by birth for doing the fishing operation so something related to the fishery level we can we, we used to give to them for the alternative livelihood then the third part of question how to stop this action that is a uh, really sensitive area <laughs> to give an answer to uh, only thing responsibility by all should take in place. That is the way only this can be stopped. Uh, how much regulations, how much penalty, how much punishment we gave also. The person should uh, feel the responsibility to the nature, then only it can be shown. And the person should feel that other fishers also doing the fishing operation in the same area. And when they do this particular activity, then the others are getting affected, then only they will stop. But uh, positive thing is that, as I said, that we have seen in many areas, uh, some of the people have been turned their mind and they have they even become the marine stewards later stage. They started for the surveillance and uh, uh, checking for the illegal fishery too. So uh, that is uh, there in all over the world in many, all the coastline areas too, the uh, rules and regulation. But uh, miniature level, comparatively, less nowadays we can say, but miniature level, 
thing. And yet another thing for the action to stop, as I said earlier, also once again, I'm killing, the people also should not buy the fish which comes with the blast fishing. Of course, you can very clearly notice that one with the markings and over the fish. Uh, that also people could uh, avoid. Then the, obviously, when the market is getting rejected, they will not do. So there are so that's what I said. Responsibility from the public side as well as the fisher side should come for that. Okay. I hope uh, it will be clear. <laughs> mm -hmm. How is it, uh, Nadia? Is it clear for you? Thank you, Mr. Salman. Yeah, welcome, Nadia. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, I think uh, because our time now is. 11 a.m. So uh, I think our time is not enough to answer all questions from participants. So now for the questions that have not answered yet, don't worry. We will send the questions for speakers and they can send the answers to the WhatsApp group and also directly send to your email. We will have speakers to send it for you, okay? So uh, now it's time for symbolic surrender of award certificates for our keynote speakers and guest teachers. Because we are very proud to have you here for Mr. Southam, Teacher Brian, Teacher Yuliana, Teacher Uri, Buchichi, and also, uh, yes, that's all. <laughs> Thank you so very much. So here, oh, here, yes. Oh. Here's uh, the certificate for Mr. Selpam Rapindranath from Maldives. Thank, Thank you, Hola. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> we are saying so. Thank you so much. And here's we have the certificate for Mrs. Asipebrina Sicilia from Palangkaraya, Indonesia. Thank you so Thank much. You. Okay, Mr. Selpam. Yeah. And then we have. The certificate for teacher Brian Atencia from Philippines. Thank you so much, teacher Brian. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, also, okay, and then we also have the certificate for teacher Juliana Pasquez from Panama. Thank you, teacher Juliana. Thank you, Hola. Beautiful. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. And also we have the certificate for teacher Uripa. Thank you, teacher Uri. Thank you okay. so much for this appreciation, teacher Hola. Okay, thank you so much. I hope uh, this uh, wonderful event also can continue for the next and next again for the future. And then, sure. uh, hmm, thank you for the knowledge given today. You are all wonderful persons in your field of work. Hopefully this activity will be a good start for us to continue our collaborative activities also in the future too. And then uh, I think this is uh, the last for our meeting. So I just want to say thank you very much too for Mr. Dr. Agustis, Agustin Teras Narang SH who are willing to attend this public lecture and also for all speakers and guest teachers, also participants here. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope what we have conducted will be useful for us. If in guiding this event I made mistakes or open someone here, please forgive me, okay? <laughs> the younger generation is the good generations to keep the sustainable of our environment for the future. Thank you very much. Have a nice day for all of you and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Thank you, uh, thank you, Rifa and Hola for the invite for me as well as and thanks for the university to invite for giving a good opportunity to interact with all other uh, 